Peace be unto you, children of God. Welcome to the Master's Word. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephanie, your host, and all of our classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God. So, you won't want to miss any of them. However, if you can't make it to our virtual classroom or to our live broadcast, then know that these are archived for your study convenience on Spreaker.com and on our website, www.themasterstouch.org. Now, let's pray. Father, you know we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, Lord. Our love and adoration for you is flowing from our lips, and we exalt you, praise you, and lift you up before all men. Lord, we thank you for your word. We praise you for uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you for your gifts of revelation, knowledge, your rhema word, and the ability to speak your word with proper utterance. Bless those who have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now today, we're going further into the blessing and as we, we're still looking deeply into our covenants in order to understand the blessing we need to understand all the covenants that God made with mankind we're going to pick up today with the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant now turn turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1 now this is the first book that there's mention of two names of two people who walked in the blood covenant of God in their life and times whose lives continue to be an example to those in the New Testament Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It goes on to list a whole list of people who were part of the lineage and genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that there are a lot of people who have walked with God, Elijah, Moses, and Joseph. And why is it that these two names stand out prominently above the others? Their names are Jesus Christ, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. So it looks as if there is a special significant work in their lives that points to the coming of Jesus. So as you see in the genealogy, there is a whole list of people right up to the time of Jesus Christ. Then we see in verse 17, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation uh, to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. All right. We see there is, in, the, in verse 17, the time period of 14 plus 14 plus 14. Three generations of 14 generations are divided into significant portions, but only two names are mentioned. The others talked about the events of the things that take place, like, for example, um, the captivity of Babylon until Christ. In the captivity of Babylon, there was a great man, great people living in those times. Those are people like Jeremiah and Daniel. Why is it that all these many people God focused on, two, Abraham and David? I want to show you that in the walk that Abraham had with God and in the walk that David had with God, there were some things in their lives that point to, the, to and reflect Jesus Christ in the New Testament. That's why these two are prominently placed in these scriptures. So let's look first at the covenant that Abraham had with God. <clears throat> we're all pretty familiar with it, but we're going to take a deep look at it. Then we're going to look at the covenant that David had with God and see how it points to the time of Jesus Christ. In Abraham's time, there is one significant portion of promise mentioned every time God speaks about the blood covenant with him. Let's look at Genesis 12. The moment God called Abraham, God began to speak about the key promise in his life. Every one of our lives is like the fa a facet of God's jewel. We may try to tap into all the different aspects of God as much as possible. But to really bring forth the fullness of God in our lives, that takes 10,000 times 10,000 years. One life is too short to bring forth all the fullness of God here. <clears throat> so what happens is that in one lifetime, we can bring forth one major facet, and the others are smaller decorations around the facet that, of that fullness of God, so that each one of our lives brings forth something from God that's gorgeous, something beautiful. Now, each one of us needs to discover what facet in our life to bring forth. What is our life and our destiny, and what is it meant to be? We can't be everything. The Bible's so clear in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that some are the legs, some are the eyes and hands, and some are the ears, you know, blah, blah, blah. And as a Christian who was desirous of everything of God, I find that difficult to accept because I want so much more of God. <laughs> but as we grow in God, we begin to see his greatness, his awesomeness, and we realize that only in heaven can we have all of God. But in this life, we have to discover what God wants us to bring forth in us. So, John the Baptist waited his life for one event, 
That's all he did, waited for that one event, to prepare the way for Jesus. Daniel was a great leader who stood by to lead the leaders of the nation in the, his time. And Daniel's life was to bring forth the prophecies of the kingdom to come. Okay, now when we think about Daniel, we think about the denomination, the desolation, as prophesied by Daniel. The 70 weeks of Jeremiah that is expounded in the book of Daniel. When I think about Moses, though, Moses' life is to bring forth the revelation of God's law and to establish principles where every generation will be judged. When I think about Joshua, his role was to bring God's people into the promised land. So what's your role in life? What's God's destiny in your life? It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to be in full-time ministry. But even in the business world, each one of us has a calling to bring the beautiful facet of God into our life and make it, let it shine. In the ministry, some will be great, mighty intercessors and also great ministers. And some of us are called into bring the front lines to bring forth the harvest. Some are called into the background to plow the ground. And some are called to bring forth praise and worship. Some are called uh, to be the intermediary role like Samuel. His life was preparatory for what is to come. He stands between the judges and the monarchy of Israel. He installed Saul, he installed David, and he set up the school of the prophets. You see, he fulfilled his role to the fullness. One call has many little details to it, but all are parts of one facet. You know, I, I can speak for myself um, uh, in this regard because my ministry started out in healing. I was given a healing, the healing school, and... Uh, my interest was in healing, and I was uh, anointed with uh, the gifts of, uh, of uh, God using me as his vessel for healing, um, uh, laying on of hands and, and people actually receiving their healing power, the healing power of God through. And so I was teaching. I was teaching about that, teaching about healing. And, of course, the whole Bible is about healing. It's, it's a, a, a sick nation that now comes to uh, health and wholeness through Christ. Anyway... Uh, but there's a lot of facets to that. God has moved my ministry in such ways that it, it just keeps almost moving over here and moving over there and enlarging my borders, enlarging my borders. I, I don't speak on um, a platform to hundreds of thousands of people. And I don't stand on a platform to do that. But I sit at my computer and reach globally those millions and millions of people that listen. And those that have ears to hear will receive it and move on and, and go on with whatever they're to glean from the messages. But And those that don't will cast it aside and go on. But the point is, my ministry, as long as I'm obedient to what God has called me to do, He keeps enlarging it and moving it. And I would never, ever, ever in my wildest dreams expect it to be sitting at a computer every day teaching the Word of God to ministers and, and ordaining them and sending them out to teach the Word of God. Nor would I have thought that I would be sitting here broadcasting over internet radio or internet television, which I do all the time, uh, the Word of God to, to reach even more multitudes. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me. And, but that's what I'm trying to show you that happens to reach the fullness of what God has intended for you. He has the plan. Let Him lead you into it, you know? Okay. Now here's an example of Samuel's call was to set up what was to come, all right? It was an intermediary role. What did he do? He set up the kingship. He did it with Saul. He even wrote a book on how a king should behave. Then he set up David as king. Then he set up the school of the prophets. You see, his ministry was setting up. Don't try to do what somebody else does, but do with all your heart what God calls you to do. When we talk about many facets, here it's actually one huge big facet. For example, I may be doing many things, but primarily my life was to educate fivefold ministers into the secrets and mysteries of God by establishing a chain of healing schools, not necessarily those who would build, but those others that I've heard will, would, would build, since healing the nations is vital if we're to accomplish God's will here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, see, I told you that was what I'd started out to do, and now it's gone completely different. It's, it's the same, only better, bigger. It may be done in a thousand ways, but the effect is always the same. Each one of us has a call, and we must be faithful to that call. Genesis 12, Abraham has one key facet, and that one facet has many colors, but one key facet. It was right there from the time God called him. We will discover our basic facet that God has for our life. It has many colors, but it's right there in front of our face when God first calls you when you were born again. And each time that you were called, there is always that one thing that stands out. Learn to discover it. It may be buried in many side issues, but it's right there. There's nothing better in life than to fulfill your destiny, my friends. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. 
and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. God is not against making your name great. He's only against you being proud about it. God shares his honor, but he doesn't share his glory. Honor means he rewards you, and he uses you as a witness to others. And as your name becomes part of a tool, it will either be hated or it will be loved. For example, if you were living in the time of Joshua and God said he would make him great, then the other tribes would say, who will be with Joshua? When they stand with Joshua, they're standing with God. And when the name Joshua is mentioned, people feared that name in all the senses that they feared the God of Joshua. Okay, so it's like we think of Jesus, we think of God, right? Joshua the same way. It's another way of saying Jesus. And during the charismatic movement, Catherine Kuhlman was greatly used by God. And the moment you mentioned her name, Catherine Kuhlman, you would find that some people hated that name and some loved it. All right? They, the moment that they hate the name, that they, what they're saying is that, no, to the Holy Spirit. That's what they're saying. Nope, I don't want anything to do with the Holy Spirit. And the moment they love the, that ministry, they love the move of the Holy Spirit. And you can see that God uses the name as a tool. Okay, let's continue to verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse. And by you all the families of the earth shall be blessed themselves. Okay, notice he talks about family. He talks about multitude. In chapter 15, that same covenant now is developed. In chapter 15, he cuts the blood covenant with Abraham, and involvement in the blood covenant is in verse 3. And Abraham said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your own shall be your heir. All right, immediately the points to Isaac, he points to Isaac, but ultimately it points to Jesus Christ. Again, the emphasis is on the heir and on the family and on the multitude of nation. Okay. Genesis 15, 17 through 19. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the, ri the river Euphrates, the land of the Ke Kenites and Kezanites and Kenizzites. Okay. <laughs> so he gives him the land and he gives him the seed to occupy the land. That's a promise to Abraham. That is further developed in chapter 17, verses 4 through 5. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Now God says this time, next year you'll have a child. Same blood covenant. <coughs> Notice the focal point. Number one, on the seed. Number two, on the land. And number three, on his multitude of descendants to occupy the land. One final part of the story, which we cannot miss, is in chapter 22 when God tests Abraham's love for him in that blood covenant and told him to offer up Isaac. Now, Abraham was obedient in verses 13 and 14, and in chapter 22, verse 14, Abraham called the, the, na called the name of the place the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. All right? In verses 15 through 18, it says, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will indeed bless you, and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall, mul your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your descendants shall all nations of the earth bless themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. Okay, pay close attention to this now. Chapter 22 sounds so much like chapter 12. If you put the two chapters side by side, the promises look exactly the same, except that one was promise, a promise and the other was a fulfillment. Do you know that there is a point in time when God gives you a promise and another point in time when He promise, the promise becomes sealed and nothing can change it again? That's true. Let's say that a lady is expecting a child in the womb. For, for those who are not in the blood covenant, who don't have the promise of having a full-term birth, as promised in Deuteronomy 28, then they stand in the danger of miscarriage at all times. And every time there is a show of blood beyond normal, there is some fear that comes up on their lives when they look at the circumstances. But when the child is born and grows up, there's a stage where you will never more have any doubts that you will ever lose the child. There is a point when God speaks something into your life, and it's still in its incubation stage. At that stage, you are still in danger of losing it, but there is a point that you reach in God when you walk with God like Abraham from chapter 12 to chapter 15 and in chapter 17 and then chapter 22. And after chapter 22, God sort of sealed it in and it said there is nothing else that you can do that will ever change this blessing. It has become sealed upon your life. Another illustration we could use is like two businessmen negotiating a deal. 
A deal usually starts with a conversation and inquiries. Then finally they may oh, make an agreement and have a simple handshake. And then the deal is there, but the actual security that you have in the natural is when you finally, both of you, go to the lawyer's office and you sign the contract. And then it's sealed. When the contract is sealed, at any time, whoever breaks the contract, he'll break it at a great loss to himself. That's the seal. Okay, here's the third illustration. Maybe you're looking to buy a house. Um, when you finally found a house that you want to buy, although you have decided that this is the house you want, the deal's not sealed until your signature goes on the piece of paper and all the proper transfers are finalized, and then you know that it is a sealed deal. The same goes with the promises of God. There are some things that he speaks into our life that are still in the incubation period. They are not sealed until a certain point in our life. But Abraham's key was to bring people into the blessings of God, to bring us into God. Uh, let, me, let me clarify something right here. I'll just make this point briefly, where I said they're not sealed until a certain point in our life. That doesn't mean that... that um, we, we know that we have the promises and we have to wait until we're almost dead to get them. That's not what I'm saying. This depends on your growth in the Word, in God. As you grow in God, then He, in this, during, during this incubation period, the, the more you spend time in the Word, the more you grow in the, in the Word of God, and the more you uh, assimilate your, your life into that of um, uh, the life of Jesus Christ, emulating Christ, the more quickly that's going to manifest. That incubation period is going to come to a, a, uh, the apex and manifest itself. Now, the New Testament in Galatians 3.13 summarizes the key aspect of Abraham's covenant that still applies to the body of Christ, verses 13 through 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree, that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The key is to receive all the blessings. You have been redeemed from all the curses of the law in Deuteronomy 28 and the blessings of the law in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. And all those blessings are in Christ and they are pictured in Abraham. Now in Abraham, I want to summarize one key point. That in Abraham, the blood covenant he has, that points to us today, is bringing us into the fullness of God's blessings. When he says Christ, the son of Abraham, he is speaking about a man about the man, mankind, moving into the fullness that God has. That fullness was lost when Adam sinned. I'm talking about all mankind, and that's why I stumbled over it. It's about mankind uh, uh, moving into the fullness that God has. And like I said, that fullness was lost when Adam sinned. When God created the whole world in six days, on the sixth day, he created man. Then he said, it is very good. All right, and he gave the whole garden and all of its contents, all of creation to Adam. He gave him authority. He gave him the blessing, his empowerment, and other blessings, and God wants to bless us. Many of God's covenanted people have not realized the fullness of the blessing of Abraham. And I'd, I would have to say that most, okay, I'm just going to go out on a limb and saw it off. Most of, of God's covenanted people, uh, the born-again people, haven't realized the fullness of the blessing that's on their life from Abraham. It is the same blessing that Adam had spoken over him at creation. Some don't receive that blessing because they don't believe it. Some because they don't have enough faith to have it. Some because they don't understand it. You know, but, but mostly because they are ignorant of the blessing. God wants you to be blessed with all the riches in Christ Jesus, blessings of the spirit, blessings of the soul, blessings of the body, blessings of the spirit man and the physical man. He wants you to have all these things. He just requires that we be faithful to all that he blesses us with. That's the hallmark of the covenant of Abraham, folks. The promise in the seed form mentioned Abraham had to leave his homeland. His first step was to leave his homeland in chapter 12, and thereafter he walked with God. In chapter 15, he cut a blood covenant with God, and God gave him a detailed promise. He even told him when it would be fulfilled. He said in the fourth generations, and Abraham's promise was his heir. And God said, I'll give you an heir. In chapter 17, he was circumcised. In chapter 22, he was tested. Chapter 12, he was separated. Chapter 15, there was revelation. Abraham had questions in his mind. After you're, you're separated, you wonder where you're going. <laughs> I mean, and God revealed it. Then there is circumcision in chapter 17 and testing in chapter 22. This same pattern is followed in the book of Joshua. And Joshua basically is to bring forth the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, which is a further development of the Abrahamic covenant. 
First, there was a separation in chapter 4. In Joshua chapter 4, they crossed the Jordan. The Jordan is like a symbol of separation from Egypt and the new land. It's like uh, when they crossed the Jordan, it was like crossing the Red Sea. What about the other two tribes that are over, uh, the, Jor are, are over the Jordan? You read in the book of Kings that these tribes were the first to fall. So crossing the river Jordan is like being separated from your relatives and friends who are ungodly, and that is your Genesis 12 experience. Then your Genesis 15 experience comes, but notice in Joshua it came together with chapter 17. So in Joshua chapter 5, they are both circumcised uh, and Joshua received a revelation of where to go and what to do. So they received both Genesis 15 and 17 experiences in Joshua chapter 5. And afterward they were tested in chapter 6 in their first battle in Jericho. But all of Abraham's covenant is to bring us into Christ. All of it. Now let's look at the Davidic covenant and that is placing us in Christ. There are two key points that Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 brings forth. God wants us to place uh, wants to place us into him and to partake of his blessings. But there is another part that he wants that is found in the blood covenant with David. What is David's life for? Well, Abraham's life was to bring us into the blessings of Christ. David's life was to bring God into our life. Notice David's life. His whole life revolves around bringing God to the people. From the time when he was anointed in the book of 1 Samuel, he was a worshiper of God, and he was anointed to be king. They already had all the promises of God. They didn't struggle to receive the blessings of Abraham. But they moved into the second area of letting God come down into our life, and David had that in his life. That was his call. That was his destiny. The moment David was anointed king by all the tribes of Israel, the first thing he did was to bring back the Ark of the Covenant. All right, what was David's main destiny in life? Sometimes we don't know what our main destiny is until we begin to see ourselves. <clears throat> he brought the ark into the capital city of the people of Israel. It was a symbol of bringing God right into the center of our life. The ark was sidetracked in some city somewhere. And although the time of the judges um, and all in the time of Samuel and all through the time of Saul, the ark was kept aside. It's like putting Jesus to one side. He's Savior, but not Lord. Okay? And David wants to bring the ark into the capital city. In the book of Second, that's why it's called A Man After His Own Heart. He gave a place, you see. God wants to be in the center of your life. And David wanted God to be in the center of, of everything, of, of everyone's life. So that's why he was a man after God's own heart. That's why he called him that. In the book of Second Samuel, chapter 5, he was anointed, and he established the capital city of Israel as Jerusalem. Then in chapter 6, he brought the ark into Jerusalem, and all that time, he was always desirous for God to be with the people. That was his great desire. In chapter 7, in verse 1, it says, The king dwelt in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies round about. The king said, I will dwell in a house, but God doesn't have a house. I want God to have a house. I want God to dwell among us. That was always David's destiny, to bring God to his people, into his people. Now, later on in David's life, there was one more thing that he, did, uh, that he didn't do until the final part of his life. Chapter 24, verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and incited, he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. Okay, now if you cross the reference to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, verse 1, Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Why did Satan stand up in that time? If you read the Bible story, every time when God was about to do some great thing, the devil <clears throat> wanted to stir up something awesome to, uh, as well, uh, something horrible. By that I mean something huge. Great demonic activity preceded the great move of God because the devil sensed something was cooking and he wanted to come and spy out what was happening. And so great demonic activity comes. You see, during the, and you'll see this all through your whole life. Look in your own history. Every time there's a giant move of God, there's a whole lot of heavy demonic stuff going on, really bad. Then, a peaceful time. God makes his move. And then we have peace for quite a while. And then, um, another move of God, here comes the demonic activity. You see, during the time of Moses, that just, that just at that time when Moses was born, there was a stirring up of opposition against the Israelites to kill every firstborn. The devil could sense something's coming. The fourth generation is here, and he, so he cooked up something to try to destroy God's move. He knows that if the move of God gets so huge, he can never stop it. So he tries to stop it when it was a little trickle, you know, just a weensy smidgen of a movement. In the time of Jesus, just as Jesus was born, the devil stirred up King Herod. 
Now, I want to point to the fact that this was the very significant point in Israel. Uh, because God was going to fulfill what he has prescribed to them in Deuteronomy 12, where he says, I will reveal to you the place where I will dwell. He told Moses, I will show you where the place is when you all come to the land. Moses died without seeing it. Samuel died without seeing it. It was up to David to bring forth the revelation. And during that time, there was a great stirring. David was pretty old by that time. And maybe David was thinking, well, many years have come and gone, and I've done my chores for the Lord. What else can I do for God? And just when he's thinking of retiring, there was the greatest thing that God had for his entire life. Remember, on this earth, we don't retire. You only become more active or less active, and that's all. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see, the devil tempted David to number Israel. Why do you think he wanted to number Israel? Because he wanted to look back and see all that God has done. There's something great coming that he did not see, and so he sinned against God. But out of that situation, he repented and fell on his knees and fasted before God. You know how the devil tried to stop Jesus? When the devil put Jesus on the cross, God turned to that great, greatest victory. Uh, there is nothing that the devil can do to destroy what God wants to do. No matter how great the cross seems to be, no matter how great a defeat it seems to be to some, all the demons were laughing when Jesus was on the cross, and all the demons will be laughing when you fall or when you fail. But there's nothing that the devil can do to stop what God wants to do. Now, as David went on his knees and repented and humbled himself, God took David out, and on that day he revealed to him the place where he would build the temple. First Chronicles 21, verse 24. But King David said to Ornan, No, but I will buy it for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings which cost me nothing. And David bought that piece of land, and that piece of land was the exact place where the temple of God was to be built. And when the temple of God was built in Solomon's time, we recognize that the presence of God came down in Second Chronicles 3.1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Mori, where the uh, Moriah, I'm sorry, where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. All right, David's life was to bring the presence of God and to bring God in a measure <clears throat> into the life of his people. Abraham's destiny was to bring God's people into the treasures and blessings of God's uh, uh, heart, of God's heart. But David's destiny was to bring God into the people's lives. Okay, that's why the second, the two covenants stand together. The covenant that God had with Abraham and the covenant that God had with David. Everything Solomon did was planned by David. As we look at what it means in the New Testament, there is a twofold blessing that Christ wants to bring. It's found in Abraham and it's found in David. Number one, he wants to bring each one of us into being born again, washed in his precious blood, into the fullness of all that he has for us. Above your highest dream, beyond your highest level of faith, above what you could ask or think. Or he wants to bring that into your life. <clears throat> These two covenants are expressed in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 and 19. Having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe. Now, everything described herein, uh, this particular scripture, is about us discovering his things. The emphasis is we discover him. We discover all that he has for us. We discover all that he wants of us. We discover His fullness, and that is an ongoing process of the Abrahamic covenant in our life. But the other part is also precious. In chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Ah, okay, I found out that the two are different. It's not automatically that when you have a certain measure of God's blessings around you that you have the same measure of God coming into you. They are two separate different processes of God working in our life. There are many who have tasted many blessings of God, yet it doesn't change them. Why do great men fall? Why do some people whom God has blessed fall? They've tasted only one part. You see, we all neglect the Davidic, Davidic covenant, which is part two. God wants to be in us. You say both are automatic. I know there's a relationship uh, between change inside and change outside, okay? But there is a change that is temporal and a change that's permanent. Everything you receive, you have to conceive on your inside. So before you receive the Abrahamic blessing, you have it on your inside. But there's a difference between receiving the gift and the, receiving the giver. 
Plus, there's a difference between having a seed only once and having something permanently within you that annually gives forth a harvest. There's a difference between having God use you once and letting God use you 24 hours a day permanently. Okay, get my drift here? All right, there's a difference between God using you and God living in you. Far too many Christians neglect part two. You say, well, it's all automatic. What about Adam and Eve? Did they receive every blessing that you can think of? They received everything you could dream of. Nothing in this life can compare to what they had in the Garden of Eden. Well then, what was lacking? The development of God's presence in them. And that is the key element. You see, they were learning. He was talking. You see the, the, this scripture, in the scripture it pops out where it says, And God walked in the cool of the day with Adam. Every day he went and walked and taught him. He was trying to come into him trying to let him know who he was and get to know me and know that uh, you are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You have my DNA. But there was an interference, wasn't there? Anyway, that's why in the book of Revelation, among the last few chapters, you'll find that finally there is joy in heaven because he declares, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. God wants to dwell in us. You see, there are different degrees of God dwelling in us. There's a measure you receive when you're born again, yet God wants more, and he wants us to welcome him. Just like Abraham, who went through the different processes before receiving all his blessings, God wants you to want him. He doesn't want you to love him because you have to, because he first loved you. That's why we love him. That's the start. But once you taste of him, and you get, it, uh, you get him inside of you, and you recognize it, oh, there's nothing that you wouldn't do for him. There's nothing. Nothing that you want more. Okay, so Abraham was separated from his kinsfolk. In chapter 12, he received divine revelation. In chapter 15, and he cut a covenant with God. Then in chapter 17, he was circumcised and he changed his name. Chapter 22, he was tested and it was sealed on his life. David went through a different process. Number one, David had received the anointing and his first call was to be a worshiper of God. God dwells in the praises of his people, my friends. We worship God so that God can dwell in us. Step one, you start as a worshiper of God. Let's read for Samuel 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. I'm sorry. Uh, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to say you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was, when they came, that he looked at uh, Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed uh, is here before him. Is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not, to, do not look at this, uh, his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abdin Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, Though there remains yet the youngest, and there uh, he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes in here. So he sent him and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good-looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, <clears throat> but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful, uh, pl uh, a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when, he dis when the distressing spirit comes upon from God upon you. <laughs> I'm, I botched that just a second. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. 
So Saul, now he's talking about King Saul here. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing a mighty man, uh, playing a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Therefore, <clears throat> Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David. Um, uh, wait a minute, I just lost my place. <laughs> Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was. Whenever the Spirit of God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand, then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Okay. We see in 1 Samuel 16 that David is a worshiper of God. That is key. That, is, that points to something. Then we move into step two. You have to overcome Goliath. Between Goliath and, the, and being a worshiper of God lie the bearer and the lion. Okay? Now, when you want God to be more in your life, there will be things that rise up, like a lion and a bear, to interfere. When you begin to learn to look beyond the gifts of the, to the giver, then you'll definitely have your 1 Samuel 16 experience. Let me explain. You know someone by his, you know someone by his or her, her gifts at first. How do we get to know one another? Well, first, by first impressions. How you dress, how you talk, how you walk, how you conduct yourself. Everything reveals something about you. Slowly, I get to know you as a person. That's why God wants us to know him first, by bringing us into him. So you see all of his blessings and all the riches and glory that he gives us. Now, God knows that it takes us time to discover him. So he gives us part one first. He brings us into him so that as we are in him, we look around and re revel in our God. But what does God want us to do? Part two, he wants us to know him and discover him. He wants us to say, oh, God, I really want to know your, your heart. And I have experienced that firsthand just exactly like that, I'll tell you. I said to the Lord, I don't want to just know you. I just I don't want to just know you're there. I want to get inside your head, inside of you. I want to I want you to come inside of me and me inside of you and I want to know everything that you think. I want to I want to pick your brain and know you you how you think and what you think and why. I want to know you, God. And you know what? That's what he gave me. And he's still giving it to me. So then as we grow in God, there are more and more and more things for us to discover about him. There are so many things that we uncover as we discover who God really is. And when we do, we come to that point where we say, God, I want you to dwell permanently in me. And God can't do all that in, in one go. Okay, it would kill us. <laughs> so he does it gradually. Step one, you have to learn first to worship. Many people can't even move into the Samuel 16 experience, the first Samuel 16 experience. When God does something great in their life, they don't think about God. That's the last thing they think of. You want to know the first thing you think they do? Well, what they do, actually, is they struggle with God about their tithes. That's the first thing they do. Then, like in 1 Samuel 17, some things will rise up like Goliath in your life that you have to watch out for. The key points are in Samuel, 1 Samuel 22. You have your Adam's cave to enter. What is Adam's cave? Adam's cave is where you discover your inner being, where you are stripped of everything that tries to tell you who you who and what you are. But really, it's telling you who and what you are not. Adam's cave is that cold, wet, dirty cave where you have to discover who you really are in God. Then, stay true to what that revelation is and that discovery in worshiping God. That's when you move into Second Samuel, and in Second Samuel, you have the three anointings. Where these three anointings are concerned, you'll find that your first anointing is in 1 Samuel 16. You have two more anointings, and these establish different things. In 2 Samuel, you'll have, uh, you'll have moved into uh, allowing Jesus to be in your life, and you have learned to let God dwell permanently in your life. 2 Samuel 2 and 2 Samuel 5, anointed twice. But, but the second anointing tells about a different thing, all right? tells us about a bunch of different things. In 2 Samuel 2, it talks about a presence that comes into your life permanently. 2 Samuel 5 talks about the presence being full in your life. Now, in 2 Samuel 2, what a tongue twister, <laughs> you're established, okay? From that day onward, David was king. It was in chapter 5 where he began to be able to do some things that he had always wanted to do. And the Bible says David had rest. He established Jerusalem, and he established the ark, and finally he had rest in God's presence. That's a beautiful story. First be in God, then God in us, 
and then union with God, which is what Jesus wants in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. We in God, God in us. Did you receive this today? I pray that you did. If you have questions or need further assistance with understanding the message, please don't hesitate to call me. You know, let me know. Uh, you know, I, I, just email me. I want to remind you that you can tune in on Mondays at, and Tuesdays at 10 a.m. and on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Pacific ma uh, time to the master classes here on Spreaker.com. Our contact information, website again, www.themasterstouch.org. That's themasterstouch.org. Email us at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net, poet at cox.net, or mthsprayer at cox.net. Remember Proverbs 4, 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Do you know what? That's what we're doing here. We're bringing you wisdom, God's wisdom. My friends, make sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. The Master's Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. Just let me say to you this. May God bless you all with his knowledge and understanding as you endeavor to live in his will and better the lives of others with his love. And know this, because we are in Christ, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. God bless you. Mm -hmm.